Welcome to the Data Leadership Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algman. Data is everywhere in our businesses and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. Today we welcome Mike Williams. Mike is the founder of Build Lab, a digital development and automation studio. Leveraging a wide array of tools and expertise, Mike and his team build everything from no-code automations to fully coded custom applications and everything in between. Mike has also founded two event ticketing companies, MJ Seats and Sharp Seat. Mike, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Anthony. So like we do with all of our first time guests, uh, why don't you just take a couple minutes and give us a more in-depth career story and how you ended up starting your businesses and, and kind of what led you to deciding this is what you wanted to do uh, in your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just kind of, uh, um, you know, got into, uh, went to school for finance, um, computer information systems, I actually came in as a finance major. I always thought I'd end up in uh, that realm. Um, uh, took a CIS like intro class, really liked it, uh, tacked on a, a double major there, um, you know, came out and worked at, at Accenture um, doing some IT consulting and stuff like that. Um, I was born in the DC area, went to school a couple hours away. So that was a really big thing for recruitment. Um, so that that's where I ended up. Uh, was working on, you know, some really big clients, um, obviously with Accenture in the, in the DC area. Um, you know, uh, a lot different than what I'm doing now. It was, I was a very small fish in a big pond there. But um, ultimately, after a, a few years, three years, I think, um, uh, got this kind of randomly got a chance to uh, start a couple businesses um, in the like event ticket space with uh, one, one of my buddies from school. Um, kind of went down that road, uh, just, you know, it was a good intro to just running a business and, and just managing operations. Um, that's what kind of got me ultimately into, um, low code, no code automation, um, uh, just trying to automate processes. You know, we didn't have a big team or anything. So it was all about like automating rep uh, repetitive stuff, um, you know, managing data, accounting, all that stuff. Um, you know, kind of wanted to scratch that itch a little more, but um, it wasn't a prime part of the business. Ended up dabbling into freelancing just to kind of try it out, see some other business problems. Um, realized there was like a lot of demand for kind of the specific kind of combo of skills and, and interests that I had. So I wanted to explore that a little more and, you know, eventually started, got to a point where um, I started transitioning to more of like a studio and trying to you know, start making some hires and like uh, really go all in on the um, the like automation and data and development side of things. And that's where I'm at right now. That's cool. So it sounds like you've, you've just kind of organically gravitated to this space where you happen to be creating companies and following a, a passion for the, the low code, no code. Um, and, and so like we were talking um, before the show started, uh, that it was really like you did work with with your MJ seats and, and sharp seat doing low code and no code. And that's kind of what led you to this. So help us for, for the folks that are less technical in the audience. What do we mean? Like, is that even I don't even understand if uh, you say no code. What even is that? Is that just moving things around on a screen or is it what, what does that really mean to a to a lay person? Yeah, it's, it's a term, a lot of people kind of use it differently and, and argue about what to call it. Um, but I, I kind of use it pretty broadly. When I say no code, um, you know, it generally refers to this suite of tools that's becoming really popular. So some of the big ones that people might be familiar with are like Zapier, um, which is an automation platform. And we use Integramat, which is kind of a competitor to them or a partner. Um, you know, that's more on the back end side of like creating automations. Those allow you to string together modules, you know, HubSpot, Slack, SQL, whatever. Um, you can even sprinkle in some custom code in there. So it helps you like build software uh, and abstracts some of the boilerplate and having to host servers and stuff like that. And then there's some front end tools too. You know, Airtable is a popular tool. That's kind of a spreadsheet database hybrid. Um, and uh, there's another like popular no-code tool is Webflow, which is more of a front-end tool for building websites. 
um, without having to write a bunch of HTML and stuff like that. And they're, you know, they're Squarespace before that. They're kind of one of the older no code tools, if you will. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the space is getting pretty popular. There's low code too, which is where you can kind of, it still takes care of a lot of boilerplate for you, but you can still sprinkle in some code here and there. Um, and then we do full custom code stuff as well, but we always try to use like serverless platforms and we use Google cloud a lot, you know, for, uh, that side of things i'm all about just building more with less is this is this something that would be approachable for a non-technologist like i think of something like i don't know maybe in, in my I, my vision on this is skewed but i think of something like like wordpress for websites or you don't really need to be pretty deep and technical if you want to be able to get something out the door it may not be great but you could do it is is no code that approachable or is it somewhere a little bit more technical than something like a, a WordPress. It, de it really depends on what you're doing. Um, there are some products that really are on the, like the no code side. Um, you know, Webflow I mentioned is one of them. Like you can build a really beautiful site with pretty much zero code knowledge um, just by doing drag and drop. And, you know, you can use the UI templates and stuff like that. So there are tools that genuinely are pretty much no code, mm -hmm. but you can get kind of as technical as you want with it. You know, we, we kind of focus on more of the heavy duty stuff, um, which is where I think we can provide the most value anyway. Obviously, if it's a tool that anyone can use, they're not going to, and they're perfectly fine with it, they're not going to hire us to help them out. So mm -hmm. we tend to be more in that middle ground of the kind of low code meets code where people kind of need to scale up a little more. Um, you mentioned like WordPress, that that's a good example. However, you know, WordPress and Webflow are more focused on like the website side of things. We do a lot of applications, so a lot of web apps, um, mobile apps as well. So those are more of like a full stack development environment, which these website builders aren't necessarily um, cut out for. So, you know, we certainly do a lot of very technical things that our, our clients couldn't do themselves. That's why they hire us. Um, but it's definitely, I'd say, more approachable. You know, I've seen people build some pretty amazing stuff who um, who don't know how to code at all. They've never written a line of it. Um, but I think it still does help if you're technical, you know, people, even with these no code tools, I've seen people get a little tripped up because they don't quite understand like how, you know, APIs work or how like a database is structured. Um, so yeah, you can kind of fall wherever you want on that spectrum. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I'd even say the same thing about something like a WordPress. Like, it helps to be technical if you're working in WordPress, especially when you need yeah, sure. to go and configure your website and, and all of that. And so I, I get that. And and to me, I'm hearing, like, this is potentially – it's it's a leverage solution where, yeah, if you have some coding skills, this, this makes you get even more from it and scale up to something where maybe you only need – three people on a team instead of 10 people on a team. Is that, is that where uh, this would really, um, w would it play uh, in, in that? Or is it, is it not even where you're, where, where you're thinking about like human resources from a, um, a team perspective where you're thinking about, you know, this is just a way to, to overcome skills gaps or, or something like that. Yeah, I think it's, it, it can definitely provide leverage. I mean, that's what we do a lot where, um, you know, even if we, a client, you know, pays us a decent bit and they have a, they pay a decent bit per month on some of these no code tools, you know, they can still get expensive if you're running a lot of stuff, but it saves them the need to have, you know, a full-time developer on staff. Mm -hmm. um, even without, it's not always necessarily about replacing people either. You know, um, a lot of times companies are scaling up, they're hiring like crazy, but they want these people can be, you know, they're, their employees can be more powerful if you give them these tools. So if we create like an internal application that does a specific thing for them, you know, that can help leverage their, you know, the uh, like human capital. Um, the goal is, you know, not to replace humans, it's to kind of leverage them and make you be able to do more with less, right? You can be, you know, running a $10 million company with like a $2 million payroll kind of thing. So, um, and uh, it also, even if it's not about leverage necessarily, it can be about, just taking repetitive tasks off the table, you know, stuff mm -hmm. that maybe it only takes 10, 15 minutes a day, you know, um, but, you know, type in some data entry stuff and like going through a to-do list, but it's really nice even automating those quick things because it just becomes one less thing you have to think about. And these businesses can focus on their core, 
you know, what they really care about, um, which usually isn't data entry or syncing data back and forth or, you know, accounting and stuff like that. They, they, they want to keep focused on their product and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a, a great leveraging tool. And um, that's why these no code, low code tools have gotten really good now. You know, most of these SaaS products now have public APIs. So it, it's really easy to like plug and stitch stuff together, mm -hmm. um, probably more so than it's ever been. I think that's why it's getting so popular now. Um, but yeah, it's, there's tons of power there. It's, uh, it's exciting. That makes a lot of sense. And you're talking like when, when you say things like helping these businesses do what they do best in, in, in their business and, and not focusing so much energy on the lower value tasks, like that's exactly the kind of thing in, in data leadership lessons that, that we think about all the time. It's like, where can we put our energies in the things that will help us differentiate our businesses versus the things that we just need to do to be able to do our businesses? And this seems to to play a lot there. And so let's talk about Build, Build Lab uh, in particular, because it, it sounds to me like you, you are fundamentally a, a and and I don't know much about Build Lab coming into this conversation. Are you fundamentally a consulting firm or do you have a product on top of that? I know you have partnerships with some um, product vendors, but how does your business work? What do you, what do, you do as your uh, core business? Yeah, we, we mostly do service work at the moment. Um, and that could be more consulting, advisory stuff. It could be more building, like technical. Um, and there's kind of two different sides too. There's like the automation, low code, no code integration side. And there's also the application side. We, you know, we build custom web apps and SaaS products and um, mobile apps and stuff like that. So people come to us for kind of a wider uh, array of things. There are some jobs where I'm just serving as, you know, it's not so much of like studio contract work. It's more of, um, I do some consultancy and like CTO, kind of partial CTO work for uh, some like exciting startups. Um, and then um, I do, I, I'm actually partnered on, on an application as well. Pretty big one that, that I can't talk about too much, but it'll drop. So I kind of do all those, those different things. Um, uh, but yeah, that's kind of uh, on the product side. We don't, I, I, I have something that I've always wanted to build. Like we kind of do build products that we can reuse here and there um, for different clients, but Ultimately, that that is the end goal. I'd love to put more product out there. Um, I always just love building like SaaS apps and and web applications. And there's a lot of tools and with like Stripe and Firebase that <clears throat> you know make that really easy these days. So I want to put more product out there for sure. I'm going to ask you a question that may not be fair, but it just it, in what you were talking about and and thinking about more products, it, it's something I've always struggled with, and that is. How do you keep on top of all of these products that exist out there and so many new capabilities? And, and I imagine like this automation and low code, no code space, you've you've talked about a number of them, not all of which I'm familiar with. How do you navigate this? How do you find out like whether or not a product is something that you would want to explore further or um, you know, integrate into your preferred stack of, of tools that you use? How do you do that just as a as a technologist? We're just going to do this sidebar for a minute because this is something that's been kind of percolating in my head and has finally come into focus enough to ask a knowledgeable person this question. So that's that's my question to you. Yeah, that's definitely a fine line to walk. You know, you don't to be chasing every new shiny thing um because <clears throat> there's just not enough hours in the day yeah um i'm luckily i'm really curious about all this stuff so i just try to stay on top of this stuff just for fun you know i try to follow the right podcasts the right people on twitter that are going to curate these things for me and i usually wait till something's a little more proven before i really dive into it you know it's every other day there's some new you know a new website builder a new automation platform and I'm not necessarily going to dive into that until I've seen it enough times like, okay, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so so -and -so all mentioned this. Uh, it sounds like this is kind of gaining steam. Um, and then that's when I'll, I'll kind of dive into it more. Um, and I, I think I've been pretty good at that so far of like hitching our horse to the right, you know, uh, wagon um, or wagon of the horse, I guess. But, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty ha happy with the stack now. And one of the benefits to doing the kind of work we do on like the automation integration side, we kind of get to dabble with, and we get paid to do it, you know, because people hire us a lot to put these things together and research. So we get to play with a lot of different tools like CRMs, for example. I mean, we've worked with just about every CRM. Um, you know, we personally use HubSpot. We do a lot of HubSpot work. Um, we're, we're partnered on them, but, 
you know, I've gotten to work with Salesforce and HubSpot and, you know, all these other CRMs. And, you know, we've gotten to work with all these different database products uh, just as working with clients. And so that compounds kind of the value over time that we can um, provide for clients because not all of them have the, their stack figured out. Some of them come to us to figure out the stack where they're like, you know, we're thinking about HubSpot or Salesforce, you know, uh, Zapier or Integromat, like we're thinking about this database product, you know, versus this one. And, uh, you know, we can kind of distill all that knowledge down into uh, some pretty valuable advice that saves a lot of time. And, and that's, a, that's a good point. It it's, makes sense to ask your trusted partners out there, what should they use? Like, and, and when you're on the industry side, you don't get the kind of exposure to all of these different tools because you're not working with dozens of different clients. You're very deep in your business, but you don't necessarily have an easy way to get exposure to these unless, uh, like you and I, these are the kinds of things we do for fun. And so that's uh, that's something that I think makes a lot of sense. Now, would you say is is CRMs and like that sales and, and marketing side of the business, is that a... Um, is that the best or hottest area for this kind of um, work that Build Lab does, or is it kind of across what what domains do you find yourselves doing work in, or, or that you find the best applicability for this kind of no code, low code types of um, solutions? Yeah, I just use that as an example because um, mm -hmm. I figured everyone can relate to that. Everyone's got a CRM usually, yeah. But we, it, it's all over the place. That kind of work. Um, some of it could be data syncing. Some people might have like a database that they want synced to their CMS and Webflow to show up on their site or make it, it can be any, sometimes we're building a front end tool where they want like a portal to manage like clients or employees and do stuff. Um, sometimes we, we do work with like e-commerce as well. So, you know, we've done a good amount of Shopify work and, um, and stuff like that, you know, and so, uh, um, and accounting, you know, people have QuickBooks and zero and all that stuff. So it's, it's really just, uh, it's definitely not just CRM. There's all sorts of, um, you know, applications we, we've done it for. But, um, you know, and generally a business will have, you know, most businesses, they have a, uh, I saw there was like the average SaaS products is like 15, 20 for a company. It's, um, there's some crazy number, you know, most, like most companies have Slack, they have G Suite for their email, they have their CRM, they have their database, they have their website on whatever. So, uh, we tend to work with like this, the full stack there and kind of tie everything together. Is there, is there a particular size of company that should be investigating this or, or thinking about this then? I wonder, like, is there a point where once you hit a certain enterprise scale that this is less useful or is it useful really at any scale? I've seen it personally be useful at, at all sorts of scales. So it'll depend on how it'll depend on what you're using it for. So a smaller company, they might have their entire infrastructure on no code, low code, because they just don't want to run servers and have a SQL database because they're not very technical. And um, so definitely like very small companies. I know for a fact, I mean, that's what I did with my own stuff. Um, so that definitely works, but I've worked, you know, we've worked with like billion dollar plus revenue companies that are also exploring these and the, those companies have engineering teams. They have their core product. Maybe they're a SaaS app or something like that and or, or an enterprise and they have like some big ERP system, but they'll use no code not to like replace their stack, but as more of a complement for maybe some internal tools. Um, that's a big thing is, you know, it's nice to be able to have not have to bug your dev team and have like a big backlog every time you want to make a change with stuff. So some of them will like, they'll have their main stack, their engineering team working on the product, and then they'll have uh, no code tools. And, and like, maybe they use Airtable for not their main database, because it wouldn't really scale for, you know, a, a big company, but they might use that as more of like an internal thing to track employees or freelancers or whatever. Um, and that way anyone can kind of build on top of it and tweak it without having to bug devs. So it, I definitely have seen it work at any scale. That's something we're kind of good at advising on too, is because we've grown out of a lot of these tools ourselves. Um, you know, I, we can kind of advise when like, you know, you might grow out of this product or you, we might want to think about this alternative uh, for this one thing, but we could maybe in another area, we can use no code just fine. 
you know, that that got me thinking because I, I would say in the work as a as a consultant that I did in uh you know a lot of large enterprises, I saw more things being driven by spreadsheets than anywhere else. And and that there's a point where you would think, well, the enterprise should have enterprise grade systems, and they do, but they also have a lot of cracks between where those systems exist, and the way people fill those cracks are often with these, just literally whatever a non technical person has in front of them, which is often Excel, and they're ending up driving huge business processes. I met I had a person that I knew who was running a multi billion dollar supply chain operation from Excel. And so those things do grow to a point where they are way past where they should be and way past where it's rational to be doing it that way anymore. So I think your point around, hey, there's still probably places where you can plug this in in a, in a very effective way. Um, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense. When would you not want to do this? Like when 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 would you just say, you know, a no code solution just isn't right for this kind of circumstance is is it that big enterprise system that is just too large where this doesn't scale or, or what what might constitute a, a place where this wouldn't apply? Yeah, it's usually those come up a lot. It's usually pretty obvious. So and that was actually my foray into um, no code tools in, in the beginning was I was running. I was using Excel as like my database, basically, like each line was a sale. You know, once I got up to 100,000 rows or something. Um, I realized that I needed to find something else. Like the workbook was super slow, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I see, I do see a lot of clients like push Excel to the limit and even Google Sheets now is very popular. Um, but I see a lot of people using like Google Sheets as a, a database. Um, but like, for example, I'll use the Airtable example. Airtable is this nice database spreadsheet hybrid. Uh, it's, uh, it makes linking data really easily. It, it, it's pretty cool. Um, but they have pretty much a hard like 50K record limit. So any enterprise storing like actual big data in there, um, you know, millions of rows, it's, it's obvious that's not going to work. Um, however, I have seen clients that have a more proper, they have a SQL database for like the core of their app, but they push, yeah, and we've set up some of these automations where we kind of aggregate and push more like high level data to Airtable, for example. So maybe the SQL database has a million like time entries, right? But will push so you can't fit those in air table but maybe we'll push like more project summary level um you know like we've had clients that do project management so in there they can view you know high level like by project by client data um and where we just kind of add up the hours and show metrics and stuff like that so you you can use them both together we've done that a lot um but it's pretty obvious when generally you don't want to put the like core app functionality say you have a web app that is tracking, you know, it's going to have millions of data points. Um, it, it could even be a small app, but maybe you're just storing a lot of data. Um, you know, like in the event ticket space, for example, we just mentioned like there's tons of data points there in terms of like events and venues and all that stuff. So um, that that's on the data side. On the more like processing side, you know, these no code tools charge by the task Zapier and Integromat. So if you're just running some automations, you know, a few times a day, that's perfectly fine for them. Um, but you might have a case where you want to run tens of thousands of tasks a day. Maybe you're crunching data from an API and you're looping through these big arrays and doing like all, you know, looping through like hundreds of thousands of records and keeping stuff in sync that could get expensive in no code land. And it could also maybe not quite scale as well or be as like reusable. Um, so that, that's a case where we'd maybe spin up a little bit of custom code. Again, it could be in conjunction with the current tools they have. So um, there's definitely that that's ultimately why I learned to code is because I grew out of some of these tools for some stuff that I was trying to do. Um, but I, we use them both every day now. So there's uh, for sure use cases for both. Hmm. And, and I mean, like so many things, the you know best inventions come when you are dealing with a problem that you can't solve with the available tools. And, and so you find new ways of doing things. Um, is this all limited to like SaaS environments and, and, and in the cloud or can you do no code in a, you know, more traditional on-premises environment or, or where's that crossover point? Yeah. I mean, almost everything we do is cloud. Some of these, a lot of these tools have enterprise like on-prem plans if you really need it. Um, 
you know, a lot of people in like med, uh, you know, healthcare might need on-prem to like comply with HIPAA or something like that. Um, or, you know, a lot of government, we, I mean, we don't do work with either of these spaces that much, but you, you can do on-prem for these things. Um, generally, I mean, you know, a lot of things are running on the cloud now. I mean, like I said, you know, CRM and your email and Slack, like most people use kind of SaaS cloud tools for all that stuff. Um, but on-prem is an option. Um, that's just not something we do as much. Got it. So you, you mentioned uh, that you uh, specialize in, in serverless development. And, and I'm curious... Uh, you know, where that stands. I, I was was a big fan of, of Lambda when it came out on AWS and, and did some microservices architecture stuff then. Um, but it's been several years now. Um where where are the, the latest innovations in that area and, and how does it like what what kinds of things are you working with today that that are particularly exciting in that space? Yeah, if you've been out of it for a couple of years, you've probably <laughs> missed a lot, honestly. It's uh that's a really exciting space. Um and there, there's certainly at Lambda and AWS has their whole cloud computing platform. That's a big one. That's been a cloud computing has been around for a while. You know, Google has Google cloud. Um, but more recently, there's a lot of more focused like app frameworks. So we use, for example, Google Firebase um, and AWS has Amplify as their version of this, but it's basically like an app backbone as a service kind of thing. So with Firebase, we would use that for authentication. Um, they have a database, like a NoSQL data store. They have file storage built in. Um, they have cloud functions, like you mentioned, Lambda. So it's kind of like we can spin up an app where we focus mostly on building the front end and the features out. And it, we kind of have this back end as a service. And we don't have to manage a server or anything. It's all kind of running on the edge. And, um, you know, it, th those are really cool services. And even on the front end side of things, there's a lot of cool frameworks like, you know, we, we use, this is a lot newer one, but it's um, Svelte as a, a front-end framework. It's a competitor to like React and Vue. Um, if you've heard of React, that's a front-end framework. And then it has its own, those all have their own app framework. So React has Next, for example, which I might be like losing some of those people, but it basically handles like routing and APIs and all the stuff you would need in an app. It just kind of like standardizes some of that for you, takes some boilerplate off the table and then you can deploy it to a lot of these cloud services like, like Vercel is a popular one. Um, Netlify is popular for websites. That's not so much for apps, but um, Netlify is really great. Um, Cloudflare is, is uh, has a sites product in beta and they have Cloudflare workers too, where you can write some JavaScript on these endpoints and kind of set up your own API. Um, so there's tons of exciting stuff there. And, and what I really love, because I hate DevOps and I'm lazy about this stuff, is they have continuous integration is, is a big thing. So where you, you know, if you push an update to GitHub, it goes ahead and like deploys your site for mm -hmm. you. And, you know, that's why I really love, cause you, you can just iterate so fast. You're not, you don't have to like SSH into a server and pull new code and, you know, do all the, like set up the SSL certificate. Like that's all stuff you just don't really have to do anymore. Um, you know, a lot, it's just every year, you know, more and more boilerplates just getting abstracted, basically. And serverless is just getting real hot right now. And that, and that's, you know, I have some, like, for anyone who thinks it's not scalable to build on these, I mean, I've, we built some big, big time stuff on there. Yeah, I, I think it, it's great to hear that there's been continued development and innovation in that serverless space because I think it, you know, I think about a lot of these things from a, an economics perspective, where I think about the the natural um, limit that we will get to in terms of the elasticity of the com computational um, need versus the price and and the way we are are consuming it. You know, serverless is is that you know, that natural limit, right? Where, where we, where we pay for and, and consume exactly what we need. There's no more servers sitting around running all the time to uh, wait and do your nightly load process. And, and I can promise at least half of the people out there listening to this are immediately thinking of an existing batch process that runs once a day on a server that stays up all the time. I mean, it, 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 you know, on some, you know, some days I'm amazed by how far we've gone and, and how many things have been, um, 
you know, addressed and, and innovated with, but then how much baggage we are still carrying with us and how many things are still anchored to uh, these designs of, you know, decades and decades ago. Um, and so, you know, I think as, as those of us that are listening to this and thinking about our own particular situations at work, you know, how can we start to do these kinds of innovative things, you know, bring in you know, automation and, and no code or low code, or, or even just things like serverless and, and start to build these workloads. Even if you're building all your own code, how can we start to implement things that have meaningful impacts to our bottom line and, and, and that efficiency that we're working with in our businesses? And so I think this becomes something that, you know, in what you're talking about and the work you're doing with Build Lab, it's something that all organizations should be thinking about if they're if they're working with computers and data and code, uh, they need to be thinking about how to get that better. And I, I think you would you would probably agree with that, right, Mike? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we have a lot of people that come to us. This is part of why I like really dove down that rabbit hole is because, you know, I would get leads that were kind of running on maybe a leaner budget, like they didn't have a full blown hundred k like full stack app budget and they wanted to build some MVP or something. And, um, you know, for, you know, for me to be able to like do that, take that work and, and pay devs and, and stuff like that at like, you know, like an affordable budget or whatever, um, we had to learn how to like build quickly and cost effectively. Um, so, you know, we don't necessarily have, you know, like, I, I, I don't necessarily want to build these like two year, you know, full stack, like these more classic, like monolithic ERP apps where we, you know, it's kind of like distributed and, um, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to build really lean, I guess is, is what, um, so I really started diving down this rabbit hole. And I used to think building a full stack app was like, before I started developing, I thought that was sounded so hard. I, I was like, man, that must take forever and cost all this money. And, um, but with these serverless platforms, yeah, we've spun up some apps really quick and we build frameworks and stuff so that each time we're starting from square four or five instead of square one. Uh, so we're continuously like building on our frameworks and yeah, you can spin up an MVP for an, an app that's going to be super performant. The compute is going to be cheap. Like you said, you just pay for what you use. I mean, we have some apps that are running now that's like three cents a month is the cost and, um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's just amazing how like fast you can build. And it it reminds me too, like we don't have to solve every problem ourselves, and and that's such a important lesson for any new entrepreneurs out there that are thinking about, you know, where am I going to spend that next dollar of the very few dollars that I have, and where am I going to spend that next hour of the never enough hours that I have? Don't go and try to build something from scratch that somebody else has already spent thousands of hours figuring out and has already solved and would cost you way less dollars than it would take you the equivalent in time. Um, especially when it's not core to your competitive advantage, you know? So, so thinking about how do we do things better, more pragmatically and, you know, happily, you know, excitedly pay for those that have done this effort already like that's leverage that is, is that is literally the definition of leverage so that's you know to me a, a, an important lesson for all of us and and if you, if this whole conversation you know for for some of those folks out there that haven't been doing a lot of direct work in the technology space some of the words that we've thrown around here are things like APIs or serverless and that stuff it may all be a little bit um confusing or or, or out there for you but what that should tell you is that, hey, there's people out there that might be able to help us with some very real, very tangible things to you that have a technology solution. And it's not, you know, a million dollar investment. It is not something that is, you know, uh, so burdensome when the, the payoff could be you could get that new app that you've been thinking about to market in a matter of weeks instead of a matter of months or years. I mean, hopefully no one's thinking about years at this point with, with an application, but, um, you know, I, I think that's very real. And, and so, you know, thinking about that, you know, what, what do businesses, you know, especially small businesses or, or, or entrepreneurs out there, when should they know, Hey, it's, it's time to really start thinking about this or, or how do they know? Yes, this is an area that I may want to invest in. And so I want you to wear both your, you know, 
practitioner in this space, but also your entrepreneurial hat? Like, how do you make that kind of decision as a business owner yourself? Yeah. Do you mean on, on just when to like build stuff on serverless specifically or? I would say serverless uh, specifically, or just even implementing a, a no code solution, or even if something as simple as like your example around uh, when you had a hundred thousand records in an Excel file, you knew, Hey, I, I need a better database. You know, that kind of uh, decision framework is what I'm thinking about. It's like, what are those, what are those indications where it's gotten a little bit of how to hand before you're running a, a, a multi-billion dollar supply chain from Excel, which is clearly too late. How do you know? How do you know as an entrepreneur, now's time to do something different? Yeah, I mean, most companies, you know, almost every company, whether they know it or not, there's probably a way software can scale their business. I mean, software is just so powerful, right? It's, and again, it costs, it might cost pennies. It's really, it's not even about a brute force thing. It's more about, you know, if you write like elegant, powerful code, um, you can just do some amazing things with that. Um, and, you know, code's going to run around the clock 24 seven. It's not going to make mistakes really. I mean, you could have bugs, but bugs aren't technically at making a mistake. It, it's probably doing, running the right line of code. It's just like the data is wrong or something. So, I mean, computers are just, uh, you know, can do things thousands of times faster than people. Um, so yeah, it's, it, there, and it, like I said, there are a million different ways. That might be a front end tool. It might be a back end tool. Um, but yeah, most people kind of know what they want. They're like, we're spending all this time doing this one thing, or, you know, we're, we're using this string of like off the shelf tools to try to use them in a way we want, but we, we actually think we might benefit from like a custom app that does more of exactly what we want to do. Um, like some people try to make their CRM do stuff like project management that maybe it's not built for, but they'll kind of try to like rig it together. Um, that, that's something we see a lot is like people kind of using all these workarounds and trying to make stuff work that for what it's not really useful for. So they might be thinking about a full stack app, but it might just be an internal tool. So like you said, they might not have a two year, you know, million dollar budget, um, but they could benefit from it um, from like a lean, you know, MVP. Uh, so those are all things we kind of think about and, and scale is one. I, I definitely, we don't get too many people that are still running out of Excel. I would certainly advise them to look into something different, but I, I do see a lot of people pushing sheets to the limit. I, I always try to get them out of sheets because um, uh, I've, I've seen some issues there. And there's like Google API limits and stuff too if you're if you're hitting a sheet too much. So uh, it's just all that stuff. I mean, it, it's you know software. I it's hard to think of a business that software can't you know help. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. And so for for the folks that are you know, currently in the car driving to the office or finishing up their jog uh, and and listening to this podcast, what what is the f first thing they should do other than check out Build Lab um, and and look about your company if if they want to learn more about no code versus you know traditional coding and and you know no code low code solutions what's the first thing they should do where do you start with something like this you know that's a good question I, I should have like a better answer loaded up for that there's so many places um you know i would say on the no code side i'll just uh i'll plug a friend they they um had me on their podcast a, a while ago but there's this company MakerPad. they were just supply, uh, acquired by zapier that's kind of a no code learning community so there's tutorials on there there's tools information um, that's a really good option if uh, on the, you know, they specialize more on the no code side, but there's certainly low code stuff. And I've seen tutorials on there where people are tying it into more full code solutions. So that's a good one. Um, you know, Twitter, like I, there's a lot of no coders kind of on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually have a list on, on my Twitter, I think it's public. So I think you can go to my Twitter. Uh, it's Mike though, by the way, T H O U G H. And then you can see, I have like a no code list on there that you can like subscribe to and that there's probably like 60 people I've added on there. Um, and then YouTube's another great one. Um, you know, uh, I mean, YouTube is where I learned to code. I mean that I feel like I have a, like a degree from YouTube. There's so much good information on there. Um, and then some of the tools specifically, like if you wanted to get into Webflow, Webflow has their own university that you can go through and tutorials. Um, so there's a lot of places I, I'd say just start digging around and, and you'll figure it out. That's awesome. I think that's a really useful. And we'll include those uh, links uh, to some of those in the show notes, certainly your Twitter um, and uh, 
you know, give folks a, an opportunity to, to kind of build upon the knowledge that they get from this. Um, but unfortunately, we are out of time. So, Mike, it's been awesome to have you on the show. Thank you. This has been a fun conversation. I've learned a lot in, in talking with you today. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully, hopefully uh, your listeners learned a thing or two. Absolutely. And thank you all for watching or listening today. In the show notes, you'll find useful links and more information about today's topic. Follow Data Leadership Lessons on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Check out my book at dataleadershipbook.com and use promo code ALGMANDL at the Dataversity Training Center for 20% off your first purchase. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact. 